certainly good to see you here. We have visitors, and you're, we're glad you're in our midst. You'll find that we do here this Sunday what the New Testament Christians did. As we read in Acts chapter 20, on the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked to them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech till midnight. They gathered then on the first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper, and I can guarantee you we won't be here till midnight. It's good to see you all, and we want to uh, share some thoughts from God's Word this morning with you. In Mark chapter 10... There's a few verses, and there's an expression that's used, and three times we see this in the New Testament. The idea is, except ye become as little children. Mark 10, starting in verse 13. And they were bringing children to him that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. He said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. In verse 15 he said, Truly I say to you, whosoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and he blessed them, laying hands on them. And that account is repeated almost verbatim in Luke chapter 18, verse 15 through 17. These these passages are an example where Jesus' teaching seems to be and may be seen by some as counterintuitive. He was telling them and he's telling us that we need to be like children. Right away you think, well, who wants to be like that? Have you ever been in an argument, maybe with your spouse? Things get a little heated and then you hear the stinging rebuke, you're being childish. Nobody, no adult, wants to be told that they are childish. We want to be adults and be seen as adults and act like adults. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, we read, When I was a child, I spake as a child. I thought as a child, in verse 11 says, I reasoned as a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. And of course, we're going to see that there's a difference between being childlike and being childish. Uh, You can think of childish as a pouting, sulking, selfish, demanding, even irrational thoughts. That's what we see in some childlike behaviors that are negative things. We would call that childish. But this morning we want to look at it from a spiritual perspective, and that is to be what it means to be childlike in faith, in our faith, and let's see what we can learn from that. And turn to Matthew chapter um, 18. We, I put this up on the board for us here. Matthew 18, 1 through 6. We'll be studying Matthew 18, 1 through 6 and look at these in in total and then in verse by verse. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who's the greatest in the kingdom? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them. Matthew 18, 3 says, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever receives such a child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of, the, of these little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. Now we're going to look at this passage verse by verse to un- get an understanding of what it means to have child like faith in Christ. And you'll notice that there's a connection here of 
being, becoming like so that we can enter into the kingdom. That tells us that there's folk inside the kingdom and folk outside the kingdom. Because he, they, he, he's tell, talking to them about, unless you become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. If we studied other passages and other things, we would see that it's a desirable thing and a thing we should strive for to be a part of the kingdom. Be a part of Christ's kingdom. That's the thing we would want to be, and we would desire to be that. And we'll talk more about that as we go. But we understand that, that not everybody is a member of the kingdom. And we want to be able to enter that kingdom. And Jesus says that unless you become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. So let's just go through this. We'll read the, I'll leave this passage up here. We'll highlight the verses, that, and we'll walk through these verses in our lesson this morning. And in, in, in verse number one, at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They, this is kind of the setup for what Jesus tells them in just a few minutes. What they wanted to know was, who's going to be advanced to the highest place in the kingdom next to the Messiah? They wanted to know, who's going to be the right-hand man? And this, was, this is the kind of thing that you would see that would happen in any sort of political party or any sort of um, uh, uprising or any sort of this is going to be our new kingdom there will be people that are following the leader and in following the leader they would naturally sometimes ask men would say hey where, how am I going to who's going to be your number one who's going to be the general who's going to be the vice whatever who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom and little did they know that Jesus would answer them in a way but also, they were thinking of an earthly kind of kingdom. Who would have the most honorable post? Who would have the greatest trust? Who would be the closest to Jesus? It didn't say which disciple actually asked that question. And maybe uh, whether it was one of them or all of them. And we know they didn't fully, as we say, they didn't fully appreciate the spiritual nature of the kingdom that Jesus was talking about. And it might be natural, and you probably see it at work. We certainly see it in politics, jockeying for who's, if I'm going to, not the vice president, then who's the speaker of the house, and all in all, we see all this in Washington politics. But this is the setup for Jesus' core teaching. In the second verse, he, he calls to him a child. He calls a child up. He looks in, in, the, in the midst, and he, he asks for this child to come forward. And he put the child in the midst of this. We don't know the age of that child, but we know some things about it because in the other passages it said they brought him infants and they carried infants to him. This is a case where, they, where he was a child that he could call to him and this child came up and he put them in front of them that everyone could see. Jesus in much of his teaching, his, his teaching is so profound and so simplistic. If he didn't say another word, he would answer that question, who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom just by having this child come up and stand in, in, the, in their midst so they could all see him. That is, Jesus was using this child as part of an object lesson. And, this, and he... In, He's really telling them that this child, who is by nature, children are small, smaller in stature, they are humble, and by nature, they would be the greatest in the kingdom. So he's first answering that question about who would be greatest. And he tells more, and more comes to light as we go on. And the key, uh, pivotal part of this passage is in verse 3. And Jesus said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter the kingdom. Now there's another part to the puzzle. We want to enter the kingdom. We know that spiritual benefit, eternal benefit will come as being, from being part of the kingdom. And we want to be able to enter that kingdom. Jesus says, you have to be like a child. And here he adds this idea of turning. He says, unless you turn and become like little children. Like the Beatitudes, Jesus here pictures faith as a simple 
helpless, trusting dependence on those who have no resources of their own. Like children, children of this age that we're talking about, they don't have any achievements yet. They, can't, they don't have a resume to put in front of you. They have nothing to offer but themselves. And little children, and I'm thinking, as I think of this little guy or gal that he had, this little child that came, he came, had come up, maybe so big, this, about this big, um, as I think about them, they, we want to talk about the characteristic, because he used this little child and says, so you, unless you become like this child, so what would that becoming like mean, and what can we learn from that? Little children have a special, at that age, have a special humble, humbleness, and they're easily taught. If you've been around those teaching them in class, or you have children of that age, um, they're easily taught. And most adults, lo you lose this along the way. Somebody said that once you start school, that's the beginning of your cynicism. But once you start in kindergarten and first grade, you become more and more cynical as you move through the uh, your, your education process. Um, and so just imagine somebody that age, and maybe it's, there's some of even here that have children of this age. A little side note for you, if you've got kids in that range, I would say anybody less than a teenager, we'll talk about those teenagers, but if you have a child like that, of that age, and we see them here in the crowd today, I'll just tell you a side note, take advantage of the precious fleeting time that you have with them. They are so impressionable. They're like a sponge. They soak up they, everything. They think that you're a hero. They think that my dad can do anything. My mom is the best whatever. They believe that. Take advantage of that. They think so much of you. Spend time with them. Teach them. Love them. Set an example for them. Talk about God and His majesty in their presence. Bring them to Bible class and worship service. Get all of that in while you can. And, I would, and, and, and I've, as I've said before, I'll say it again, we have young mothers in the, uh, the, in the audience today and young fathers as well, and see them on Sunday morning, when, Wednesday night. And I just imagine what you go through. Our kids are all grown, so now we don't have to worry about getting them ready for uh, worship service. But I know the young mothers, they, first of all, you've got to get yourself ready. That takes a lot. And then you've got to get maybe one or two more kids ready. And, of course, you've got to make sure your husband's ready and wearing what he's supposed to do. So Pam still has that one thing to worry about, getting ready for being here. But I just think about all you young mothers and getting everybody in that family ready, out the door, in the car, and to worship service, Bible study on time. Hats off. You're doing the work of the Lord. When children are very young, like Jesus is talking about, here's some characteristics of them that I want us to think about this morning. Characteristics of these kids. And if you know any of these kids like that, and they're in our audience today, you'll agree with me on these points. First of all, they don't desire authority. They don't really want to be in charge. And they regard one another without distinction. It doesn't matter if their parents are really rich or their parents are really poor or they have a different skin color than them. You'll find that kids of this age play with anybody and they, are, they treat each other equally and fairly. It's just part of being that age. It hasn't been taught out of them. They're free from malice, uh, ill will. They're teachable. And most importantly thing, they're willing to be dependent on their parents. If, if mom and dad say, get in the car, they will they'll start working and going towards getting in the car. And they don't know where they're going, but they're, they trust and depend on their parents. When they're sick, they come to their mom or their dad. They, they depend on you to help them. They know that you're going to help them feel better. They trust and want to obey. Now, I'll tell you, as they grow up, that's why this time is so precious to us, but as they get older, they go to school, they pick up things from their playmates, their friends, or older siblings, and then when they approach puberty, and in teenage years, they could very well show a different kind of disposition 
rebellion and disobedience and so on. And so that's why these years are so precious. I'm reminded of Ecclesiastes 12.1. You remember this? It, it's, it's quoted many times. We, we say it to young people all the time. Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth, when the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when you shall say, I have no pleasure in them. And I twisted that for parents. It's not in the Bible, but it says, teach your children about their creator in the days of their youth. When the evil days come not, or the years draw nigh, when you shall say, I have no pleasure in them. The first one was talking about no pleasure in the years. This is talking about no pleasure in your teenage youngins that are with you, driving you crazy. But it's going to happen. You, kids move from the age to where then they start thinking on their own, and they start saying, I'm going to do this in that way, this my way, that way. And we uh, know that we, we take comfort during those times that if you train up a child in the way he should go, when he's old, he'll not depart from it. And it may take some time and some years for that to happen. But these are marks of early childhood that we're talking about, possibly embodied by this young person, this little child that Jesus put in front of them to teach a lesson to those people. True qualities of Christians. And Jesus turns back in, in verse 4, Jesus turns back to this idea of humility. Whosoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Humility and this thought of humility goes back to verse 1 where they ask the question and, and it was about, you know, who's going to be, what position are we going to be in in, your, in, this, in this new kingdom? And most of you know I'm retired and I can tell you I'm blessed. I'm blessed by a lot of things in retirement. And, I, and I've told people about this that I kind of hesitate to talk about how much fun it is to be retired and all this stuff because I know they still got to work and maybe for a very long time. So I don't want to be too, you know, ha ha ha. But I do feel that way sometimes on a Monday morning or something like people I see them going to work and I'm not. So it was great. It's great. But one of the things I'm blessed about is I'm not, I was in the corporate world. Strange place it is. The corporate worlds where you're bombarded with folks, and I mean this, that constantly talk about what they just bought, where they lived, your address is very important in the corporate world I'm familiar with. They'll talk, somehow they'll work into their conversation the house they have. They'll talk about the cruise they just took, where they summered in Europe. And then they, then they, they bring up something about that new car they have and the troubles they've had with this brand new, lots and high, very expensive car. Then they also talk about Ivy League school their kids are going to. When it gets around June time frame and stuff, and then they're going to be telling you about where their child's going to school. We've heard all this stuff on the news about people that pay lots of money to make sure their child goes to the school that, so they can tell everybody in the corporate world, so-and-so on my side going to there. You, you might agree, it's a status symbol world, and humility is not one of the common traits you find in most places in corporate America today. But I'm glad that I'm just, my, most of my interaction is with humble Christians like yourself. And I think of the Apostle Paul. He had spiritual gifts and abilities, an inspired writer of most of the books in the New Testament. He was honored with being personally useful to God. In Christ and the success of the early preaching of the gospel, converting sinners, planting churches, labored abundantly in the kingdom. Yet Paul thought of himself to be the chief of sinners, less than all the saints, and not even unworthy to be called an apostle. Humbleness is a very important thing to cultivate. We don't want to think too highly of ourselves, but we want to each decide of our own free will that we're going to be totally controlled by the will of God. The fifth verse, the fifth verse, oh well, the fifth verse, it, I, it would turn red if it could. Whosoever receives such a child in my name receives me. Now Paul, the, the, now the writer Jesus tells us here a little bit more about this. When you receive a little child, we don't expect anything to re in return. We call, child comes to us, little child comes to us, crawls up in our lap. All they give us is themselves. And the little child, the little child 
represents a new convert or a young believer. To receive such one, and think about it from a spiritual perspective, Jesus said that whosoever is such a child, but he's talking about us becoming like those children, like those children, and so there's a spiritual implication about our responsibility to other brothers, to young Christians, to young converts, to young believers. And to receive such a person like that is to receive Christ Himself. Helping a child of God, expecting nothing in return, brings us a satisfying feeling and it also stores up treasure in heaven for us. And when we help each other and we look out for one another, we know that we're storing up treasure in, in heaven for ourselves. Jesus says in Matthew 25 and 40, Inasmuch as you've done it to the one of the least of my brethren, you've done it to me. So realize that when we're watching out for receiving young Christians and even young children, but young Christians and Christians, we do so in a way by honoring Christ. And Jesus said, you've done that to me. God is a rewarder of those who love and reward him. Now let's look at verse 6. But whosoever causes one of the little ones who believe in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and be drowned in the depths of the sea. This is an ominous kind of end to Jesus' discussion on this. He talks about what we need to do. And then he talks about what other people should do about young children or young people in the faith if you look at it spiritually. And now he finishes up by saying, if you ever cause one of these little ones to believe in me to sin, it'd be better for him to have a millstone. And he could be speaking about that physical young people. He can also be speaking in a spiritual term about young Christians and, and weak brethren. These little ones would be Christians that manifest the spirit of these little children. Um, and as I said, some commentators say that he's not just talking about little children, he's implying recent converts and, young, uh, and new members of the church and brethren like that. The meaning is be better for this person never have lived than to suffer the consequences for that kind of sin. We don't ever want to be a stumbling block to any Christian. It would be regarded as a most serious offense and would be punished accordingly. And being punished by society is bad, but you can imagine being compared as he tried to make it for us here with this idea about a millstone hung around the person's neck. The authorities can destroy our bodies. We could be put in jail here, but God will, can destroy our body and commit your soul to hell forever. Well, that's that passage. And as I thought about it, there's three things we want to think about that come to us from Jesus teaching. The next slide will show us, the start uh, work, walking, we'll work our way through that. Um, he called this little child to him, he brought him, set him in the midst, and he used that child as a powerful tool. Christ often taught by signs and representations like this. You remember he said, consider the lilies. He would look around and see something, a plant, a flower, and say, and make a spiritual lesson with it. He did this with this child in a, in a powerful way. And we, we, can, we can relate to that. We take note of these little kids around us here, and uh, maybe ones, children we know at home, grandchildren, our, our, our family members that we have, and we can see the qualities that we talked about being manifest in those children. And then before we finish, we'll just look at three things. The first one is the necessity of uh, humility. In his statement in, in Matthew 18 and 3, that's a powerful, solemn statement that commands our attention. And we talked about children are small, they're little in their body, and they're low in their stature. We must have a low and little spirit, and we must think about ourselves and our relationship to God as others. Humility is a hard lesson to learn. There's danger and for us in doing well. Sometimes as we conquer temptation, as we raise our children, as we work on our marriage, as we work on our faith, we're do, we may be doing well, and that's a dangerous time for us. 1 Corinthians 10 and 12 says, Therefore, let any who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So we don't want to be, we want to work hard and do well and grow as Christians, 
but don't take too much and don't brag about being humble. The next one, we must be converted. This, this converted here means turning. The Greek word is strephono. It's you turn your life around. There's a great example of this in Matthew 19 and 16. It didn't turn out so good, but it's a good example of what's required in this idea of turning and changing everything about what we think about ourselves. Matthew 19 and 16. And behold, a man came up and said, Teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? There's only one that's good. If you'd enter life, keep his commandments. He said to him, Which ones? Jesus said, Thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear fault witness, honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Verse 20 of Matthew 19, the young man said to him, All these I've kept, what do I still lack? So this man needed to be converted, and he wasn't. He, he, he was a good man in lots of ways. And Jesus said in verse 21, If you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give it to the poor that you'll have treasure in heaven and come follow me. By all accounts, this man was a good man. Listen to all that he said he did. All those things, he kept all the law and all these things, but he had one thing that was in the way of him in eternal life, and that was his attitude, his mindset towards money. And the way we know this is because Jesus looked at him, knowing all, knew there was one thing he lacked, and that was he was in love with money and all those things. And his challenge was given to him, and Jesus said, if you to enter the kingdom, you have to uh, sell all that you have and give to the poor. There's a kind of a sad uh, uh, end to this particular one, at least in that reading, because we read that he went his way sorrowful because he had money, much possessions. But to enter the kingdom, we must be converted. And that means to be of another mind. Altogether in our frame and temper, we must have other thoughts of ourselves. And we need to think of not just ourselves, but even change the way we think about the kingdom of heaven. We had to change how we look and see worldly ambition and our selfishness must put, be put aside. And the last one is we must have childlike faith. In this change or conversion, or we will become little children. Not childish, like some would be described in Ephesians 4, 14, so that we are no longer children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by the wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and its deceitful schemes. Not like that. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we grow up in every way to Him who is the head and to Christ. And like children, we must <laughs> desire the sincere, milk, milk, the sincere milk of the Word, which is called out in 1 Peter 2 and 2. And also, if it, like children, we would be inoffensive and void of malice. We read about this in 1 Corinthians 14 and 20, where we read, Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be infants in evil or malice, some translation, but in your thinking be mature. Like children, we must trust implicitly and not be careful or worried about anything. Matthew 6, 31 through 33. Jesus said, why are you anxious, saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? Is that not the things we worry about a lot? Maybe too much. In verse 32 of Matthew 6, he says, For the Gentiles seek after these things. Your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. We have to learn to trust and obey. Our final passage this morning about trust and and obey. We have to trust in God. We don't have to worry. We don't can't worry, wake up worrying every day about what we're going to, what our job, what's this going to happen, what's going to happen here, what's going to happen. We have to look above and beyond all those things to put our focus and attention on God. But this idea of trust and obey, trusting God and obeying Him, 
We're going to sing a song, Trust and Obey, in just a moment. Before we do that, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 8. There's a beautiful example of a guy that learns to trust and obey. This is the Ethiopian eunuch. And we'll, we'll, the Ethiopian unit was traveling. He had been to Jerusalem. He's headed home. He's in his chariot reading the prophet Isaiah. He might be like a distracted driver today, reading while they drive down the road. Yes, have you ever seen anybody reading and driving? Yeah. Not just texting and stuff. I've seen people reading things, like papers and stuff. But he probably was being driven by a driver. He was an Ethiopian eunuch, a high official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. But he was riding and reading. And in verse 30, Philip joins him and ran to him. Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. And he asked, he said, do you understand what you're reading? And the eunuch said, how can I unless someone guides me? So here he's reading. He's studying uh, the Old Testament doesn't understand everything, and Philip, and he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Verse 32, and he read the passage about like a sheep. He, he was led to the slaughter like a lamb before his shearers was silent, and he opened not his mouth. And his humiliation just was denied in him, and who can describe this generation for his life was taken from the earth. In verse 34, the, the eunuch asked Philip the key question. He said, and whom, I ask you, does this prophet say this is, about himself or someone else? In verse 35, Philip opened his mouth and began with this scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Now we know that this eunuch now heard the word. The Bible tells us that Philip started there and preached Jesus to him. And we can see that he understands there's more there than what we read. More said than what we're reading. And we see this in this next verse. And this man learns to trust. Because as they were going down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? So we know some things that happened as Philip was talking to this guy about the Christ that was prophesied in the Old Testament that he didn't understand. He, the eunuch, didn't understand. And in the teaching the gospel about Christ, he also talked to him about what he needed to do to be saved. And the eunuch said, here's water, what prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop, and they both went down in the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. So you can see there's an example of a man that was studying the Bible, studying the Word, not understanding. Someone came along to help him understand that. He trusted in what he read and heard in the Scriptures about the Gospel, and then he obeyed that when he said, hey, here's what. So he, we understand that he was told what he needed to do to be saved, and he believed that he needed to do something, and that is be baptized. And that's why they stopped and he was baptized. And that's why we offer the invitation song and our services today and every time we come together because there may be somebody here in this audience this morning that has studied the scriptures and you've come to the realization that you're in a, you're in a lost and undone uh, condition and you want to do something about that. And if you're outside of Christ, if you're outside the kingdom and you want to be part of the kingdom, the formula is laid out for us in the New Testament. And that's to repent of your sins, to confess Christ, to uh, be baptized and live your life in dedication to your Lord. That's what the Bible tells us. Where are you today? Are you ready to trust and obey? There may be somebody else here who, in the, in the group this morning that needs the prayers of the church. If there's anything we can do for anyone here this morning, come while we stand.